Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 40 of the Unchained Vodcast. Today, Brand is not here. He's working. Uh, but we have Rec, the guild leader of All or Nothing, with us to talk about Vikings. Hello, hello. Thank you guys for inviting me on the show. Thank you for, for once we have somebody of the faction <laughs> we talk about. <laughs> it only took six weeks to get somebody. Uh, <laughs> but today we're going to talk about the Viking realm. Uh, we're going to do a whole lot of speculation, looking at some of the details that we do have about the different classes, um, scarce as they are, and uh, just see what we come up with, see what uh, things we like, what things we uh, think may be coming in the game. Uh, as people should hopefully know, there was finally a um, weekend test of some of the bot battles and everything for CU. Things are starting to ramp up. They've released the Beta 1, uh, well, the first part of the Beta 1 doc for yeah. people to view on their website and on their forums. Uh, so things are starting to come out. It's getting a little bit exciting, maybe. Uh, still probably a ways off, but... yeah. <laughs> Sadly, and maybe at some point there'll be some crafting info in there. You know, I, I maybe even in a doc form. <laughs> I stopped hoping for that. My heart <laughs> can take it. Anyway, so Vikings. Uh, I thought it would be a little bit different this time. The first thing I wanted to talk about with the Vikings because. Vikings are pretty pretty much a big thing. I mean, Vikings are kind of popular in uh, most Western cultures right now. Uh, it's Viking TV shows, <laughs> Viking um, history shows. Uh, Viking history and lore has always kind of been a, a pretty popular thing. Yeah. Uh, so how do you think they can CSE can simultaneously deliver what people are expecting of the Vikings while also branching them out so they're not just way too much of what people would expect from the Vikings? That's a good question. I mean, I think what they're going to be doing with the the lore of the game and how it's not historic lore and it's more of just kind of Mark's twist on the lore will help a little bit. I um, mean, you can see the, the inspiration there on a couple of the classes like the Child of Loki or the Molnir, but they're different enough that I don't think that you know, we can already see that a few lore historians are a little peeved that things are not exactly <laughs> historic. So sure. I think that'll help a little bit. Um, as far as worrying about them being overpopulated and whatnot, I mean, I, I think just having a variety of servers will help a little bit. Um, Vikings might be very popular, but since we're not just going to be on one mega server, I don't think we really have to worry about them being overpopulated on every server or even you know more than half of the servers most likely i think mm -hmm. oh, yeah i kind of agree on that um i like that they have the feel of the vikings um they have some of the lesser known um lore of the viking like the true. the valkyries um are well their take on the valkyries because the historical valkyries are completely different um, the Jotnar uh, is something a lot of people who pretend to know what Viking lore is don't know about. Um, and then you have all the classes, as Rex said, uh, they give you the feeling of being in a Viking realm without going into too much into the, uh, the overused archetypes mm -hmm. of the Vikings. Uh, the skull is actually a historical, uh, job career uh for the um, the bards in the viking realms in real life but it's so um unused by so many games that could have used it that i like that it's actually here and uh, and it can have a good significance mm -hmm. and i think there's uh you know there's benefit to familiarity as well you know see having it deliver things that people do expect uh they kind of want to go in there they and know have an idea of what Vikings are going to be like based on their their preconceived notions of them. Uh, I agree with Thantanos that you know I think Banes and Boons can be used to add a lot of versatility and options and uh, differentiation to some of the different characters and classes and things that make them a little bit different. Uh, the Viking lore seems to um, 
at least by their leader, it seems like there might be something dragon related in there that doesn't necessarily directly uh, shoot straight into um, their kind of established or real world lore. Um, and as Tennis said, the idea of them having a water based mage that isn't a healer. I mean, there are games, of course, that do that. Yeah. Um, wow, but not a lot. For one, has a has a very control heavy ma- what ice mage, but. You know, it's not it's not something that's really super um heavily done and of course there are class i mean you know I, I didn't have a ton of frost mages and things running necessarily running around and in that's their, what um, i like also in the sto- that, story so there yeah, are things that, that are added that i also like you talked about the the um, ice i also like mm-hmm. that they didn't focus on the cold thing Yes, you you don't have any ice class in that in, well the wave weaver will probably have some ice abilities, but for the most part, it's not actually um, ice focused like so many games that have Viking where it's like mm-hmm. oh it's the frozen <laughs> lands and everything. Well, actually, uh, since we were talking about the the lore guys, historically, the Viking lands were actually not that frozen all the time. And the uh, I, I like how their abilities are really more, um, they're almost more uh, terror and death based than they are, you know, like fixated on frost and just melee all mm-hmm. the time and things like that. Um, so kind of going into that, lo- looking <clears throat> at the classes and, and going back to kind of our established structure, what are your favorite uh, or what is your favorite uh, Viking class and why? I think uh, my favorite, which is kind of funny because it's one I might not actually play myself, is probably the Hellbound. Um, just because they, I can just, my mind kind of goes off in, in wild tangents thinking about what they could be like because I kind of imagine something that's maybe a hybrid between a uh, World of Warcraft Restoration Druid and an Affliction Warlock. Um, you know, just but in a way that's draining the life from enemies and then siphoning it to allies directly. So kind of being a two classes and one there sounds really interesting. Um, and I just because you know blood is a very unique resource in this game, mm-hmm. and their mechanic is very heavily tied into blood use. Uh, I think that's really interesting and gives them a unique role combined with their kind of panic oriented uh, focus. And for me, I, I already said it in a previous cast. Uh, for me, the Child of Loki is probably one of my favorite classes. Um, actually, with the Scald, uh, strangely enough, um, I, I don't know. I like the the concept of the of the Scald and uh, that they actually have probably some uh, some more um, buff focused. Um, abilities real um i don't know in, in their lore it's not so much their abilities that i like but the lore of the of the class and the way they they treated it with all those um buffing songs and songs and uh mm-hmm. and just the overall feeling of an actual scald viking scald uh in the middle of the battlefield yeah for me uh i think it's definitely the arisen uh, which is funny because for the for I think for the last two realms easily one of my least favorite classes for both of them is the scout, uh, <laughs> True. but I really like the arisen um, mainly because of lore. I mean just the just the very the concept of it and the concept of them being reborn every day, uh, but also the emphasis that they have on panic abilities is something that um, I think is pretty cool. Uh, I like any kind of crowd control or debuffing class. Uh, I can get behind all of that. So um, let's see. And you just like vomiting on people. I do. I do like the idea of being able to vo- <laughs> just terror vomit all over people. I, I would be doing that all day, just kamikaze into combat. <laughs> <laughs> <And that's... laughs> that is a that pretty fun ability. Day. So. What would you say then, um, and again, this this is for Chad as well, what would you say, though they're kind of busy talking about movies at the, at the moment, uh, <laughs> it's your, fa- your least favorite class? For me, that's got to be the, the Arisen. Um, 
<laughs> I'm not so much about lore as I am about mechanics. Um, and and for me, the Arisen is just the weak link out of all the classes on the Viking side, um, specifically because of them being tied to their tombstone and the tombstone being stationary. Uh, you know, while they've got some very nice benefits um, in terms of you know not having a blood pool that can be drained and having uh, a stronger focus on actual combat abilities than the other two scouts just the fact that they can't leave the radius of their tombstone without releasing kind of going out to a different area um, and then suiciding again to me that seems kind of anti the entire point of being a scout i kind of wonder how they're going to fulfill that role um, when they have to kind of go out and then immediately limit themselves to a, a specific mm-hmm. area yeah for me it's probably the stone healer um, not so much the for the abilities. Well, I'm, I don't like healers in general. At least I don't like playing them. <clears throat> but I don't know the concept of it. Uh, for me, it's yeah, it's different. But yeah, I don't know. It's it's not something uh, I really enjoy looking at the abilities and the the stories behind them. I don't know. It it doesn't strike me as a, any interest uh, in in that class mm-hmm. at all. Does it bother you more that it's their their mechanics or just the way that they deliver them by throwing um, rocks or what? What is yeah, it? Yeah, the throwing rocks. It it's fun and and yeah, it it sounds a bit gimmicky, honestly, uh, to me. It, it's it's a fun idea throwing rocks to heal people, but at the end of the day, I don't know. It's I I would get tired of it really fast. I, I share your opinion on that. I, I feel like the only person I know that really likes that idea was Mark himself. Mm-hmm. Um, for a lot of people, it's one of those things where you kind of smile and, you know, ah, it's cute, but <laughs> wears off after, you know, yeah. two or three minutes. And then you're like, that's kind of silly and ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, mechanics wise, though, I think they're going to be a really strong class. I mean, they're they're the only healer, to my knowledge, that won't require direct line of sight on the person that they're healing mm. just through the use yeah. of their, their stones being able yeah. to have spells cast through them. So as long as you have line of sight to your stone and then the stone to the person that you're healing, you know, that's kind of something really unique that I like about the yes. stone healer. Yeah, no, the, the mechanics themselves are interesting. Um, the way to deliver them. Yeah. It's, it's fun to do some puns on that for like two minutes, as you said, and then, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. TDD has a has the devout that gives a similar sort of not si- exactly similar, but a similar sort of mechanic wherein they don't necessarily have to be right there healing somebody, um, mm-hmm. but they're not a healer, you know, they're yeah. healer. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see, Oldovic mentions the wave we- weaver because water magic is dull. Uh, and Tennis <laughs> kind of agreed about the arisen. Uh, I think for me, the arisen question comes to. Uh, whether or not they they're intended to do most of their scouting in the arisen form or in their living form, uh, I had assumed yeah. that they would be doing the most of the scout actual scouting in the living form, and then they just use the arisen form as kind of like a combat support uh, yeah. role. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, th- I I could be remembering wrong, but um, I was under the impression that most of the scouting would be done in the forms that give them the concealment, which would be their non-human forms yeah i don't know because uh, um, uh, they don't have very the, much info it's like three yeah. abilities listed on the website yeah for me the the reason uh sounds more like a rogue than a scout a little um, bit a little bit they their abilities sound more focused on combat than exploration uh, well, that's one of the things Ben said in the uh, class reveal for the scouts mm-hmm. is that they are more combat oriented than the other scouts. Yes. Um, and, they and are intended absolutely to participate more in kind of a group battle as a, mm-hmm. as a support, um, you know, debuffing people with you yeah. know, the vomit abilities and the panic and whatnot. But as, as far as their offensive capabilities just to themselves. I mean, one of their bands greatly reduces the power, um, you know, that they get from weapons. So I yeah. still think that they're they're intended to be more in the scout role, um, just kind of heavy, as heavy as you could be on the offense side for mm-hmm. a scout, which would still be relatively low. 
Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, the uh, for me, my least favorite class, and somebody mentioned this a minute ago in there, has not... I don't think they were saying it was their least favorite class, but for me, it's it's probably going to be the Slaughter Wolf. Um, one, I, I don't like pet class as much anyway. Uh, <laughs> it's not it's not something I really get behind uh, very often. And so when the pet classes were announced in the first place, I was like, lame. I don't want those in my game. Uh, but for me, of the pet classes, they seem to be the most dull, in my opinion. Um and the most complicated, I guess, just because they have these uh, wolves that they can summon, and they can summon elemental... They basically can summon elemental spirit pets. Okay, well, what MMO doesn't have something that can summon elemental spirit pets, just about? Um, but then on top of that, they have this mechanic that seems potentially problematic from a balance standpoint, but also kind of annoying to manage, where you've got a go and collect the wolf spirits to increase the strength of your abilities uh, or which abilities you have available but then also if your wolves get too far away from you chasing somebody then they're gonna you're gonna lose control of them and they're gonna be gone and all this stuff and i'm like god that just sounds like a pain in the ass <laughs> yeah they can they can really be i think they're gonna be pretty interesting i mean they've got some plus sides too they're supposed to have the strongest uh spirit pets out of all the the different trios there um the fact that i'm not i'm not really sure i don't remember too much about having to go collect the different spirits thing um but i'm assuming that would be something that you could kind of go you know do get done and not really have to deal with it too much um past a certain yeah, point too often, yeah um yeah what i really like about them is i'm like you i, I don't like pet classes but I don't like pet classes usually because pet management in MMOs is usually done very poorly. You have a separate kind of mm -hmm. thing where you have to target someone and then send them to attack or yeah. tell them to withdraw. For the Slaughter Wolf, it really sounds like that their uh, components where they summon the wolves are also commands to do an action. So you would mm -hmm. you know, summon the Frost Wolf, you would have an enemy selected, um, use that spell and it would summon them and also send them to do a command as you do that. So the way that they've kind of got that set up um, seems like it maybe saves you a little bit of the hassle that pet classes usually have. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as them kind of being too far out of range and then kind of doing their own thing, to me I think that's almost a positive instead of a negative because that means that at least if you die and your wolves linger around, they can still be a benefit to your allies, maybe get a kill, you know, randomly, or at least just, you know, kind of cause some chaos. Yeah, I think yeah, for me, so... what I meant with that being potentially problematic was not so much for the player, but I, it seems like something that should be problematic game-wise, uh, both from performance, but also um, balance-wise. You know, how do you... Uh, manage how many of these wolves someone can summon, and then if they get out of range... They can summon more, and those keep running around attacking people and stuff. And you know how? What if you have numerous different slaughter wolves on the field? They've all got wolves going everywhere, getting out of their control, and roaming around, still attacking their enemies. And uh, that thing is—it just seems like extra stuff that they then have to go. Okay, well, how do we mitigate this so it doesn't become a problem to, with just to random fair, spear uh, wolves everywhere? To be fair, and it brings another point there: is that it's a it's a bane. Uh, if it's too much of a pain, nobody will choose it, so why have it in the game? Well, I don't so, think it's going to be a problem in terms of performance or in you know kind of managing it anyway, mm -hmm. just because you know inherently all the wolves start to go away right when you summon them. They're yeah. all on a timer. So there's I would assume you know CSE is going to be designing mm -hmm. with the intention of if I spammed wolves and I'm not getting harassed, there is, you know, a maximum number of wolves I could possibly have before the first wolf disappears. And they're going to balance because of your mana. That. Right, and they're going to balance around that. So, I mean, uh, you do have a point where, like, if there's maybe, like, say, hypothetically, 10 slaughter wolves and each of them has uh, three wolves each, um, and then, you know, nine of the actual slaughter wolves die, you could have one slaughter wolf controlling 30 wolf pets for a short period of time but that's just going to be a short period of time thing before they start disappearing he can't keep that number going um so i don't really think that that's going to be a big issue yeah and um 
to stay a bit on the pet class, even if it's a bit out of um, out of context in the subject. The pet mm-hmm. classes, <clears throat> the way they set them up is that it's not pet classes. It's just a visual difference on spells. Your pets are not actually pets. They're just spells that last longer than a fireball. What, that's, what, that's what pet it. classes don't have things that aren't spells in the game? Well, the pet classes in, in most other games are you have a pet that is here and stays here. All the, the cl- pet classes in CU are pets that are on a timer. They don't stay here all the time. You have to resummon them. Uh, they're, um, and the, the, one of the problems they had was that uh, pets are actually physical objects. So you have the clipping issue mm-hmm. that they don't have in this one. So there are a few problems that, um, for me, also make me not like pet classes, that I don't have a problem with, uh, with those spirit pet classes that we have in CU where uh, they're they're all going to be on a timer. It's basically casting spells uh, with a longer t- uh, effect time. Are the, the dread color pets not permanent? No, they're not. Hmm. Mm. I don't recall them ever saying that these were necessarily temporary and had to be resummoned. But I mean, I knew the slaughter wolves. They're specifically um, and explicitly timed pets that the duration yeah. goes down, and then the TDD pets are more like just you know missiles basically um, yeah, yeah. but I, I had not rem- uh, really known that the dread collar pet was not permanent as far as i remember they're all um I, I don't remember i think it was ben who was saying or mark who was saying that they treat the pets from the spirit classes as manifestation of a spell not an actual pet which is why they that, actually, though. yeah. Which is why they actually went for the those spirit pet classes, other than not having any pet classes at all. Well, uh, I wonder how that's that going to was... work for the dread collar, though, because the dread yeah. collar has, you know, the different types of pets uh, yeah. that he well, can summon, and some of those wouldn't they use their own abilities? Like, how does an ability, which is not a pet but an ability itself, cast more abilities? Well, that's um, the um, the, you know that. My, my understanding of it was that, uh, one, the reason they made them essentially abilities was to make them non-physical entities, you know, because of the clipping yes. issue and the performance issue. It wasn't necessarily yeah. that they wanted them to be temporary. Uh, they may have made them temporary, but it wasn't necessarily that we have to make them disappear like a spell would. They wanted them to be able to not have the clipping issue and not have yes. the, um, you know, the collision issue. issue. And, you know, to... To um, I forgot what the other thing I said was. <laughs> um, but also, you know, they have set up abilities uh, when they were talking about the the new abilitations rehabilitation system, mm-hmm. uh, the new ability system. They were talking about how they've set up abilities that can fire off other abilities. You know, you can shoot yeah. a arrow and it hits, and then it causes an another effect or does something else uh, off of that, and then that can have an effect and so on and so forth. Um, so I I would assume that part of that would enable the pets to exist as abilities that can then activate their own effects and abilities and things as yeah they and and the pets are very focused uh in in terms of uh their uses especially for the dread color is mm-hmm. it specifically says great sword abilities so you can have a certain set of random abilities that this the pet is going to use uh, the other one is shadow magic so you have just a, a set number of spells the 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 pet is going to automatically use. So those are, uh, you don't need to control those pets. You summon them and then either you control them or you just send them away. And you you can have this, the, um, uh, the slaughter wolf can have several pets at a time. We're not sure that the other ones can, as far as I can remember. That's true. Um... The dread color, I, if I remember correctly, the dread color can only have one type of pet at a time. I'm pretty sure. So, yeah. right. Unless they're using, uh, I think it's either their death curse or divine intervention. Yeah. And uh, Tennis brought up a good point that you know the part of the other purpose of making them spells is that they then affect the air system as well uh, mm-hmm. instead of being uh, people. I, th- I think the, the opinions I've seen of the pet classes and 
we're, we're kind of going long into pet classes, but uh, <laughs> the the I think the opinions I've seen in pet classes kind of depends on the individual person by and large. Like some <laughs> yes. people really like some people who love pet classes seem to really like that tedium of having to summon the thing and then go, you go there and you do this yeah. and you use this ability the micromanaging. and so on and so forth. They love that. I hate that. The only game I've enjoyed pets was in Champions Online, and that's only because you could summon robots that just floated around behind you and did something passively. Like, I could go, Sentry Turret! <laughs> heal bot! Heal me! And I walked around, and it was basically just a buff that followed me around. <laughs> I got no time for commanding uh, <laughs> pets. Yeah, no, I'm not a big fan of pet classes either. Alright, so... It was a good discussion, uh, but let's move on to class <laughs> synergy section. Uh, what types of class synergies do y'all expect to see uh, or think might be might be a thing in the Vikings? Because I will admit, I was kind of hard pressed to find many. Uh, well, I mean, the most obvious one is probably the Molnir and the uh, Wave Weaver, you know, kind of soaking people and then yeah. using the lightning abilities. Um, mm -hmm. I think besides that, it's it's a little more subtle. We know that the the Shadow Walker can uh, debuff um, enemies for the kind of the rest of the Viking melee train, which will be very useful. Uh, the Child of Loki can suppress uh, snares on uh, a defensive target. Um, so, I mean, Child of Loki can run in with the Molnir, can't be snared. Um, that's going to be useful. Yeah, um, the Slaughter Wolf with the Wave Weaver, just the way that uh, Frost Wolves or Fire Wolves might interact with the uh, Water Magic. Mm -hmm. would be some interesting air effects. The Wave Weaver in general, I mean, there's just got to be some really cool possibilities with that um, bubble shape that they have, that they put a the hydro shell on people. Mm -hmm. um, if they combined that shape with, you know, a, one of their snaring runes and stuff, you could even just put those on the uh, slaughter wolf's pets and then send in the wolves to like kamikaze and kind of like snare people before the main force charges in. Um, without having bigger sample, you know, components and stuff, it's, mm -hmm. it's there really isn't a whole lot of explicit things to go on but there's a lot of you know subtle possibilities to think about uh -huh. anything chris i i don't see a lot of well I, as you said the wave weaver and as um i think it was tennis saying about the the mjolnir and the wave weaver not just mm -hmm. with the, the pulling them but the, the air system with the the water and the electricity uh, being able to do some sort of AOE damage. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The Slaughter Wolf, I don't see a lot of synergy with a lot of things, honestly, uh, in terms of the Slaughter Wolf. Just their yeah, elemental. They, they get a howl right, that it that... can be a, yeah. pretty useful. There, yeah, there are a lot the, of the, scald, the Scald with uh, the Winter Shadow, probably. Um, since the Winter Shadow is probably the most mobile of the... Mobile of the archers uh giving it e even more uh mobility mm -hmm. uh, especially since they're um physics based and there's a specific buff from the skull to the physics based damage while most of the other damage uh is done the mjolnir and the wave weavers are magic based um the slaughter wolf as well um so the the skull with the, the winter shadow would really buff the archer's abilities and uh, the arrows damage. Mm -hmm. And you, you do have a strong panic theme going on. I mm -hmm. mean, the Arisen can cause panic, mm -hmm. the Child of Loki can cause panic, the Hellbound and the Shadow Walker uh, yeah. can all do panic. So, I mean, that's that's going to be a big one right there. There's a little bit, I don't know if you'd call it a synergy, but I mean, the Child of Loki can cause poison damage, the Hellbound can siphon blood. Those are two different even types of damage, so I don't know really how well that's going to go together, but you know, if they assist, that's potentially a lot of spread yeah. pressure. If they dot, switch target, dot, switch mm -hmm. target. Yeah, the yeah. one I think the two things that I mainly noticed was one, the uh, the panic, uh, number of classes that cause panic. Also, a couple classes causing crowd control abilities. Uh, these initial abilities they put up haven't really 
had a lot of CC in them, uh, but for the ones that are put up there, the Vikings have a pretty sizable chunk of that, as well as the TDD uh, coming in with a lot of that as well. Um, and so, but but I kind of agree w with what you said earlier that it seems like a lot of the a lot of the potential synergies are going to be a bit more subtle. They're not they're perhaps not quite as obvious as with the Arthurians and the TDD, where some of the classes are just straight up like, I straight up buff his damage. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> for, um, just about. And yeah. uh, that that has kind of made me wonder if perhaps uh, what they're going for with the Vikings um, might be, uh, and not saying this is necessarily 100% the case, but uh, might be that they're going for more of a uh, setup with them where perhaps, you know, the Arthur we, we talked in the Arthurian segment, we talked about the Arthurians being very preparation based. Like, we feel mm -hmm. like you've really got to have your, your team comp and your plan set out ahead of time, know what you want to do, and who you're bringing with you. And I wonder if the Vikings might be on the opposite side of that spectrum a little bit, where perhaps they're wanting people who are going to be need to focus a little bit more on managing the managing their groups as a as opposed to spending as much time preparing and making sure they have exactly the classes that they want in every group well that's one thing i like about the vikings is i think that they're one of the most flexible realms i mean when you when you mm -hmm. count the melee and ranged classes uh you know tdd only you have three melee classes once you get all of the melee in the game um, Arthurians, I think, are very evenly split, you know, between close mm -hmm. range, medium, and yeah. long range. Uh, Vikings are very heavily melee oriented. I mean, you've got the the normal three, the heavy fighter, the shapeshifter, and the stealther. But then their support is capable of meleeing, and their archer is capable of meleeing. So you have five. I think that's one more than even the Arthurian. Um, mm -hmm. So I think their groups are actually more flexible because you've got the the Winter Shadow that can be kind of both, and the Scald, which counts as a melee, where the other support yeah. classes, you really wouldn't count them as anything except, I mean, you might count a Dark Fool as a ranged class, I guess. Kind of, uh, but not really either. Yeah, but that but then that gives you more options in how you build mm, a group. Yeah. I mean, you could mm -hmm. build um, a couple mages, a couple archers, and those archers can be either or, or you can do a full melee group and you can include something that's not typically considered a melee that's still capable of actually going in there and fighting. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I don't don't really know if they're going to be that much harder to group build. Well, I don't think... It, I, I was thinking more that they would be easier. Um, to group well, I agree because with that. It, be, because I don't <clears throat> think it's going to be as important. I'm not saying, of course... Um, like Tennis uh, just mentioned, I'm not saying, of course, that they don't want the perfect eight-man group. You know, yeah. surely they, they have something in mind, like we want this and this and this and this for our group because we're going to do this. Uh, but I'm thinking maybe for the Vikings, it's not quite as important. Like if they have to swap out something mm -hmm. to grab some random person or whatever, you know, it's not going to be that big of a deal because, well, hey, you know, they've, they've at least got a... Sh their archer even still has a shield and a sword can stab somebody. Yeah. So, yay, yeah, why not? And um, they, they are that... the realm that has kind of the most survivability in each of their classes, mm -hmm. as in they can hold their own, um, yeah, even at their less optimal range, basically. Yeah, I think it kind of fits with the with the style of the realm, with the lore mm -hmm. of the realm and everything, because they're yeah. Vikings. They're kind of portrayed as barbaric, and that is kind of a barbaric notion that you're not going to necessarily have to be in regimented groups where everything mm -hmm. has to be precise. You go, no, nah, we can, uh, some of us have some general abilities and we can swap in and out and everybody has uh, certainly things that they specialize in, but yeah. they can fill in a little bit better than some of the other realms can. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, I lost track of chat here a little bit. Olvig asks, and um, I, I don't know, Synergies are synergies a good or a bad thing game wise? I would say it is a good thing, but it mm -hmm. in this game it might not be a hundred percent necessary like in other games where you need to have the synergies between the classes. Uh, it, it will be much more. Yeah, it will be much more uh, in terms of play style. Like for example, uh, that that might be uh, one of the reasons why we 
especially for us who don't play Vikings, don't see a lot of synergies between the classes because they this realm, the way the playstyle of the realm is designed, doesn't need that, that many synergies. While the Arthurians, um, the playstyle for the Arthurian realm is very much built around the synergies uh, between different classes, mm -hmm. since some of them really have no survivability on their own. They need a synergy with another class. Mm -hmm. And I think they might be kind of worried. You know, these are just sample pages. There might yeah. be a lot of synergy for Vikings, but I think that they, yeah. with having so many melee-capable classes, they're probably hesitant to kind of commit to saying, here's a bunch of synergies between all yeah. of these melee classes. And that could very easily be too much, considering how many melee they have. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rocket Mist actually... Um brought up something that's going to go to not my next question, but probably the one the one right after that. Uh, of whether or not it's a big deal if they are mostly melee. And um, we're definitely going to get in, in, into that in these next two questions, I think. Uh, because what do you think is the overall realm combat style for the Vikings? Well, I mean, the Vikings, The one of the things that really took me over the edge, uh, me and Novelty is the other guild leader, um, we were kind of going forth, back and forth between the TDD and the Vikings. Um, and what really pushed it over um, for us, we were thinking conceptually, would you agree that, you know, kind of, this might be an overgeneralization, but that the Arthurians are defensive, Vikings uh, yeah. are offensive, uh, and the TDD yes. are hit and run, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I was thinking about that, to me, that, that says that the Vikings are the only realm that's in full control of applying their their kind of distinct advantage. Um, and what I mean by that is um, if, you know, I'm, I'm a Viking group, um, it's up to me to attack you in the correct way. But if you're an Arthurian group and I can see that you're defensively set up, that would be silly of me to attack you yeah. when you're playing to your strength instead of mine. Likewise, if we come across a TDD group and they attack us and then kind of pull back, it's within our power then to not chase them and play into their strength again. Mm -hmm. But as the TDD or the Arthurians, if you get caught off guard and attacked, you've been caught off guard and attacked. Like that, that is the Viking strength. There's no... There's nothing you can do at that point if you've been attacked because that's what they do. They attack, boom, advantage, gained, done. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that one-sided, but definitely if the Vikings attack before, for example, for, between Vikings and Arthurians, uh, if the Vikings attack before the Arthurians have been able to set themselves up uh, and ready to take on the charge, they will have a huge advantage. The Arthurians uh, might be able to recover from that, uh, right, but right. the Vikings will have an advantage, definitely. Yes, it's uh, just the only realm that I thought it was in absolute control. You know, Vikings can certainly be caught off guard, and you know, there's nothing that says an Arthurian group couldn't uh, attack a Viking group uh, by surprise and have a huge advantage if they did so. But I just I wasn't really comfortable with the TDD group kind of being a hit and run focus thing. Mm -hmm. um, Cause you can't make someone, you can't force them into a long drawn out fight like you might want. Um, and as a, an Arthurian, I wasn't really excited about the idea that we would only be at our absolute best in a, in a kind of defensive situation where we can kind of set up and stuff. I wanted something that could be a little more spontaneous than that. Maybe mm -hmm. something that's able to roam a little bit more freely than that. Yeah, the um, I, I think with the TDD, I think you can kind of force people into drawn out conflicts if they're mobile enough. You know, if they're able to yeah. engage and disengage enough. Uh, but that brings up to... Um, uh, part of the strategy for the Vikings that I noticed as I was going through all the classes and look at their abilities and everything, and a big part of what st struck out to me that I hadn't really noticed before is, uh, previously I was looking at the Vikings and going, okay, they have all these, they have like some speed, they've got mobility, they've got some, even their melee classes have some a little bit of range to them and everything to engage people. 
Uh, and they, but the, even, but their ranged people even have melee abilities, so they can get in there, get in melee, hit you, and they're very offensive melee focused. Uh, but then, as I was going through the abilities, I started to realize uh, that they also have a lot of debuffing and CC abilities in those close range battles. You know, the Wave Weaver can has a bunch of slow abilities, and they have uh, different slows and, and abilities to slow people down. And, and panic abilities to decrease people's combat effectiveness and prevent them from being able to escape once they get into that melee, uh, which would be interesting against, like, the TDD, because if the TDD's thing is getting in, getting out, and then they can go in and slow them all, how do they get back out? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, let's see. I was just checking chat real quick. Uh, <laughs> but that does go, you know, into the next question, uh, which following, uh, really the same trend we, same, uh, question we used for the last couple episodes, which is, uh, for the Vikings, how can they break outside of that? You know, we have to be offensive melee. Are there any ways that they can break out of that mold and do something a little bit uh, differently and still do well at it? I mean, I think that's, we're not really going to be able to answer that question until it probably beta two. Um, I mean, maybe they could do something crazy using camo and kind of baiting people. Um, Kind of until we really know more about the maximum ranges of the mm -hmm. the mages and the archers relative to the other two realms, um, I don't really know if I could answer that. Um, I believe it was said on one of the uh, either the archer or the mage class reveal that while you know the Arthurians have the longest range um, and Vikings the shortest, that the ranges would still kind of fall into a certain spectrum. So like even though a, a water weaver would be quote short range, it's still short range for a mage, which is still long range. Yeah, exactly. So how how much of that is actually going to impact their ability to, you know, play to different kind of strategies and tactics? I don't know. I don't know. We'll just have to see. Yeah, tennis mentioned um you know, being able to rush in uh, using more of a kiting style. Uh, for me, the one thing I did think of is a lot of their classes have survivability. Um, they don't really seem to have like any one class that's ta you know tanky like the uh, you know like the Black Knight or anything. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of their other different classes have survivability. Their bard can actually suppress wounds. Um, and also, with the crowd control effects of their mage, which again, as you just pointed out, their mage is the short range mage compared to the other mages, but still yeah. had, still compared to every other unit, that's a pretty long that's range. Long range. Yeah. Um, so I could see them, as, and then, then on top of that, even their melee units have, some of their melee units have a range attack, like the Mjolnir can throw his hammer and everything and hit mm -hmm. people at kind of a range. Uh, so what I noticed of that is they have a versatility, but also, you know, they're really powerful up close, but they still have extra kind of uh, medium range power uh, and the CC. So it seems like what they could do for like defending keeps is instead of, you know, the Arthurian approach where you just form the line, you get here with your long range shooting and you try to hold them there. Uh, instead, they almost have like an incentive to kind of allow people into the keep hit them with all their CC and everything as they come into range for that and get into that medium range where all their units can kind of use ranged attacks to hit things uh, to soften things up as they're kind of funneling in and then engage yeah. uh, to give them then coupled with, you know, the survive extra survivability of many of their different right classes uh, that might enable them to have kind of a, um, I guess a a slowing and and whittling down approach for a for a defensive combat when you're talking about like sieges. Yeah, you see that a lot in other games too. And in, in uh, Warhammer Online, it was mm -hmm. highly effective to you know your hold hold up in the keep. If everybody gets kind of bunched up and just kind of gets pretty stagnant, um, you know, especially in this game where you can build multiple exits to your keep, you just kind of leave, go around the back, get a little bit out of their clip range, and then come and attack them. And if you need to, retreat right back into your keep. But you don't have to, you know, just sit in the keep the whole time. Yeah. 
um, really as anybody, but that would, like you said, especially be good for the Vikings. Yeah, I think it's, and it's kind of similar, I think, to what we said about the TDD as well, um, uh, about the ability to kind of root things down and um, use a bit more of a, uh, I guess for the TDD it would still be more of a hit and run inside the keep, but um, whereas the Vikings I was picturing maybe a little bit more of just softening them up before you engage in melee, because the yeah. Vikings, why, why wouldn't they want to engage in melee anyway? That's where they're strong yeah. anyway, so it's like, yeah, come on, bring it. Um, mm -hmm. But they do have that ability to kind of, they seem to have that ability to kind of root things down and then use their medium range prowess, which, you know, for something, it might not, that might not work as well against the TDD. That might be an advantage for the TDD because they do have a little bit more range and, and maneuverability. Whereas the Arthurians, if they're attacking, uh, we, we, we generally seem to either want to be at long range or very close range. Yeah. We don't want to be in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that much of a strength. Yeah. In the middle range. I agree. One thing Maya Id here said in uh, chat was he wondered if the Vikings are going to be better as multiple groups working together or better as smaller eight-man groups. Uh, one thing, it's I mean, it's definitely out of date, but on the old Banes and Boons list that they released to the public, Vikings were the only realm that actually had boons they could select that would give them bonuses when they were outnumbered. Um, yeah. And it was directly in relation to how outnumbered they were. Mm -hmm. That being said, I don't I think you would still have multiple groups, you know, when you're doing multiple group objectives, you would still just have eight when you're doing eight man objectives. Mm -hmm. So even if those are something that's carried over uh, into the release of the game, you know, maybe more so than the other realms, it's going to benefit you to be slightly smaller, but yeah. I don't think it's going to be that big of a thing. And I think uh, it comes from what all, all we said before. Um, they they can work together, but they're still in their uh, synergy of multiple group. They're still uh, very much independent. Uh, each group can survive on their own. It's not as much as um, like a full army, like uh, for example the Arthurian would be, or really working in small skirmish groups like the TDE would be. It would be more like eight men's choosing to work together but being able to work on their own right um, so it's it's like a gathering of groups rather than a full army well at the risk of spoiling what i intend to do as a guild leader for my guild <laughs> um because i think this is actually a pretty common thing to do is we'll probably run maybe two groups but they'll be just out of clip range of one another um, so if our eight man runs into another eight man, we won't necessarily call our other group to come help. But if we run and do, you know, something that's maybe a 16 man, we'll engage knowing that our other group could come and flank very quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, Odovic asks an interesting question that I'm not sure how to answer yet. Which realm is strongest attacking and defending a keep? On paper... And only on paper, since we haven't tested that. Yeah. Arthurians would be the um, strongest at defending a keep. And um, for attacking, I'd say maybe the Vikings, uh, because of the survivability of their classes uh, and the ability to strike uh, very strongly mm -hmm. rather than just long drawn out battles. Yeah, the only thing I have, to, the only reason I'm torn on that, I mean, I think the Arthurians are focused on defense, so, I mean, that's yeah. kind of a given. Uh, they they take up positions, they're very rooted, they have some very tough close-range people and some very tough long-range people um, for defending keeps. Uh, but attacking keeps, Arthurians, as someone mentioned earlier, also seem to have the greatest long-range capacity, so... You can see Arthurians setting up at long range and just bombarding the crap out of a keep in siege mode uh, from long range with their mages yeah. and everything. And, you know, what are they going to do? They have to come out and defend, fight it and everything. Uh, I don't think that necessarily makes them the best, though. Uh, but it is a consideration because they still have to get to the keep and they still have to get inside the keep yes. and take it. Um, so that's And the Arthurians are, are probably the most vulnerable in movement. Yes. I'm going to say outside that of the keep. Too too early to say because uh -huh. when it comes to keep defense i would think that more so than what realm you are it's going to be how well designed your actual building is yes. um, that's going to be very important 
when it comes and to offense, setups. that's just true too. And when it, when it comes to offense, I would think you know having long range, short range, whatever that might be completely irrelevant depending on the siege weapons. I mean, if all the siege weapons are normalized to have the same range. I would assume you know, a trebuchet is going to have more range than a flame warden. So that might mm -hmm. not make a huge difference. Yeah. Um, I think it'll really come down to uh, specific abilities and ability synergies and creative strategy. I mean, one of the things I've, I've wondered is if, uh, if you're familiar, there's a druid ability um, where they can cast kind of what's a, a point-blank area of effect, but they do it from an ally target. Now, if you can put that on... A spirit mage pet, they could shoot spirit bulls through the walls and then PBA we from the spirit mm -hmm. bull to to kill everybody through the walls. <laughs> I mean, we just yeah. we don't know if that'll work yet, but I mean, yeah. those are the kinds of things that could work and could totally you know blow up everybody's expectations of of what would be the best. And I'm gonna yeah. veer completely from the subject and say I want the siege. Uh, to be the, one of the deciding factor is how well designed your siege engines are and your crafters operating them, your siege yeah. engineers. I think because um, that, that will ahead. be also a factor. I think one thing that I, I want to note is um, I think every, every realm certainly has kind of a realm strategy and focus that, they're, yeah. that the devs are trying to put into them. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think those are to a certain degree kind of an overgeneralization because mm -hmm. you know the vikings yep. certainly at their best in design wise look like they, they have the most advantage in close range being offensive but how much of an advantage is that uh if they make it too much of an advantage then you no one would ever want to engage them in melee there has to yeah. be a chance to actually beat them through player skill uh, right. and, and coordination and I hate to bring up a Dark Age of Camelot example because we know CU is not Dark Age of Camelot yeah. too, but I mean Midgard was known as the melee realm, but that absolutely did not mean that you couldn't have an Albion or a Hibernian mm -hmm. melee group that was capable of being just as good, if not better, than a Midgard melee group. So, like you said, I think it's it is probably referenced too much as overgeneralization. I think it you're looking at something that's going to be a very slight advantage overall, um, and really more might be more powerful just in people's minds than in reality. Yeah, I um, we don't see it like that, but I like to think that a lot of what we right now consider a big difference between um, realms is actually more flavor uh, than game changer uh, in terms of, yeah, Vikings being all powerful in melee and nobody can challenge them there. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's more like yes, there is, there are slightly more powerful, and they have more options in that kind of situations. But that doesn't mean that the other realms don't have any chances of competing against them. And yeah, I, I like the idea of it coming down to player skill. And mm. I think the um, the biggest example of this is like the TDD. They're they're <laughs> identified by everybody as the hit and run realm, which can be fun, but who? One, who has fun doing that all the, all the time? It's a huge pain in the ass to organize that kind of a thing and coordinate everybody together. And two, especially when you involve pugs and you're trying to get them, hey, we're going to move <laughs> it. No, 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 run away. Uh, it, you, you don't do that all the time. So they have to still be able to fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with groups, and they have to also be able to fight at range. The Vikings are the shortest range, but I'm sure there's still going to be mechanics and ways that they can engage at pretty comparable long-range distances with the Arthurians. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if they can't, then you know that's going to make areas of the game that are just not fun or enjoyable for each of the realms. Yeah, and, and also a huge disadvantage for some of the realms, uh, because knowing, and that's again my take on the game, but knowing how the gathering of materials and how game changer having materials to craft is going to be if only Arthurians that are good at setting up defense and, and hunkering down can hold a mine for long periods of time to make it profitable to gather your materials while for example the tdd can't hold a mine for say a few hours to have their crafters being able to gather enough to make the uh, armors and weapons for their realm that is a huge game disadvantage and balance problem. So that's why I think 
uh, in in love case, it's players' uh, preconceptions uh, on on realm flavors more than actual uh, huge gameplay changer. Right. I mean, when you really inspect everything, you, you still have to really get down to the class level to inspect the differences. And mm-hmm. CSC's done such a good job when it comes to having, you know, the three classes in a trio fill the same role, but do it in a very asymmetrically balanced way to the point where, you know, you can say Vikings are the melee realm, Arthurians are the defensive realm, but you can see specific examples where the Vikings maybe have a more defensive class and the Arthurians have a more offensive class when you inspect certain trios. And I, I'm pretty sure they've done that intentionally as you go down all the realms so that it's really more balanced um, as a whole um, when you look at it at that class level, which is really where you have to look at it if you want to you know, be very realistic about what their capabilities are. And really, that that whole last bit was, uh, I, I started laughing a little bit because that was basically all us uh, saying, these last three episodes were total bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, really, because there is. are I mean, differences. We do a lot of speculation on here. Yes, um, and there are still so, clear differences. Yeah, in, for sure. In the way the the characters are going to get are going to be played, it's more the uh, over generalization of the realm mm-hmm. as a concept rather than the classes themselves. Yeah. Uh, that is probably going to be less relevant than we than not just us to actually most player think. Yeah, so I guess my last question here before we wrap up is um, same one we used uh, that I think Bran brought up on the last two streams. What is there any class that you, for the Vikings, you would steal from another realm uh, to replace them? I would probably steal the Wisp. Um, <laughs> I think that, I mean, just replacing the Arisen would be a wink, weak link would be really good the wisp just has such uh interesting capabilities by having the lantern able to be carried by uh, another you know realm mate being able to set up you know because their their wisp form decays over time but they can rest not only in their lantern but in another wisp's lantern Mm -hmm. um i have this interesting idea of setting up you know maybe like a waypoint system of multiple lanterns so that you can travel very far much farther than you could as a singular uh, Wisp not working with anyone mm-hmm. else. That to me feels like it would be much more effective fulfilling the the role as a, a realm scout than the Arisen would. Besides that, you know, I, I actually really like the Empath. Um, I think it's very interesting. And, you know, probably like everyone else, I think the Red Cap is very cool. But those those would be the three probably in order. Um, for me, I don't plan on playing a Viking, so yeah. I wouldn't steal from other realms to add to that. But as I said before, uh, I steal this child of Loki from the Vikings and put it in the Arthurians. Oh. Uh, and I would actually um, uh, swap for the uh, Enchanted Knight to the uh, to add to the Vikings. I, I very much don't that. want the Enchanted Knight. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can keep him. We don't want him. <laughs> I did consider that uh, just because um, the possible added kind of stability and still the, it still has the versatility uh, kind of mm-hmm. thing going on. Uh, but for me, and I would I would never actually propose this deal because uh, I would not want the Vikings to have this. Um, <laughs> but if I were the Vikings, uh, at least for and, and of course this is I'm a bit biased because I want to play Arthurian, uh, and it's an Arthurian class, but. I think I would want to steal, actually want to steal the Blackguard um, because I could see the benefit. The Blackguard is essentially like the longest range, is the longest range Archer class. And I could, even though they're very squishy, uh, I could see the benefit of having that sort of range capability added on to the Vikings and their mobility uh, as opposed to having kind of a hybrid Archer class with some melee abilities i mean they already have several classes that can kind of do that even their scout can do that um so for me i could see kind of having that extra long range capability added in while they're charging into the group the arrows are just flying in 
And Olvik has a good question I wanted to bring up also. Um, well, not the way he did, but asking about the two missing races, what you were hoping to see as the two missing classes. Before adding more classes, I'd like to, then, to ask them to fill one of the races um, <laughs> that I actually um, really like the idea of, but we have no, absolutely no clue on, is the Ulfednar. I would like them to actually start building on that character because right now all we have is a shadow and no. Well, they have they have teased be... little pictures in the uh, newsletters recently. Yeah. yeah, but it's it's still not as developed as any of the races in any of the realms right now. Right. Right. Yeah, like I... even just a becoming story would be nice. Yeah, I'm always fussing about the lack of Sterum stuff. There's no becoming story. There's, There's no, no becoming anything story either. Yeah. There's just pictures. And I'm like, come on, give me yeah. some Sturm info. And then people are like, well, the Ilfenar don't even have a picture, man. So. Yeah, <laughs> they have one concept art. That's it. Right. And at least the Sturm are already in the game. They're sure. already in the tests. With the butt wings. <laughs> With the butt wings. <laughs> All right, well... Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out and hanging out with us. Rec, thank you for coming and hanging out with us. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for having me. Good to have Viking viewpoint on these things. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody, thank you for coming. We are, of course, going to be back in two weeks with episode 41. This one will be a particularly special episode. We're going to talk about game lore. Uh, we're going to take a look at Camelon Chain lore, and if everything works out correctly, we should have a very special guest. Uh, Max mm -hmm. should be on here with us to talk about the game's lore. So, prep your lore questions if you have anything you haven't already yep. asked. Uh, <laughs> we're going we're gonna, to uh, put some things together ourselves and hopefully talk about you know areas of the lore we like, uh, areas we uh, are curious about, and all that kind of stuff. So... Thank you all. Hope to see you again in two weeks. If you're on YouTube watching this video later on, like, subscribe, all that kind of good stuff. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I'll see you on two weeks. Thank, thanks again, Rec, for uh, being actual one of the leaders of the other realms uh, showing up to the cast. Yeah, thank you for having me.